Captain Picard up here. You know. Anyhow, a big focus of today's class is going to be on relationships. All right. We're going to talk so much about relationships, you're going to think you're in Dr. Phil's class, not my class, all right? Uh, if, you, you know, if you think about it, relationships are really the cornerstone of a relational database. I mean, a relational database that has relationships in it. And really, that's, that's you know, a, a critical component of it. Getting the relationships right is one of the key things in database design. So we talked a little bit about the relationships last time. We talked about them in the sense that, um, you know, we said that, you know, if you have a class and a section, there's a relationship between the two, and it's implemented via a foreign key. All right, we talked about that, so we introduced that. So that's the sort of thing I mean. Um, what we will do is, now is, is we'll look at them in exhaustive detail because there's really several different kinds of relationships and um, you need to be able to identify those relationships and then you need to be able to create them in access. And, and that's what we're going to go over uh, today. We might also throw in some examples of surrogate keys uh, in, in our example because um, that's, that's something important too. Our last example we did not use auto number or surrogate keys. Um, relationships. Uh, oh, we're also going to look at ERDs, which is an Entity Relationship Diagram. And, and I, I think everyone has their own slight flavor of how they draw ERDs. I try to keep them very simple. All right? And we'll see how I use ERDs, and uh, maybe you can compare and contrast that uh, to the book. Um, really, the, the, the process of database design is critical. All right? We spend so much time in this class on that. Uh, for that very reason. Um, think of the database as being sort of the foundation of the, um, uh, of an organization's applications and an organization's IT department. I hope this will illustrate that point. All right. Let's go back to 1950, before there were databases and before um, computers were in widespread use. All right. Did organizations have customers back then? Yeah, of course they did. Did those customers place orders with the organization? Of course they did. Did they order products? Of course they did. Did those products have prices? Of course they did. Were those products shipped to their customers? Of course they were. All right. The fundamental data of an organization stays constant or relatively constant over time. I won't say constant, but it's relatively unchanging. All right? Think of a college. You know, this college was started in 1964, I think. I'm not sure, but around that time, give or take. Were there students back then? Yes. Were there professors back then? Yes. Were there classes? Yes. All right? Were there majors? Were there degrees? Yes, 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 yes. All right? So the data remains relatively constant. Not to say there aren't some new things in, introduced from time to time, but the basic structure of the data is constant. If you were to look at a database design, if you were to go back in time and do a database design then and come back to this era and do it, I'll bet there'd be a lot of similarities to it. What that points to in my mind is that this is a foundation, you know. What do we know about the foundation of a house, you know? We know number, number one is number one job is to be solid, right? You don't want to be working on it all the time. You want it to be solid, fixed in there, because everything sits on top of it. And relational databases are the same way. You want to make sure it's right. Now, one thing I, I, I say over and over and over again in all my classes is things like this don't happen by accident. All right, you don't sling something together and have it well designed and solid and uh, flexible. It requires a conscious design effort, a conscious planning effort. Just like in English class, all right, your teachers probably tell you to write an outline before you write a paper, all right? Or write an outline and write a rough draft and edit it and they describe a process of going through. What they're really talking about is a process to design a good paper, you know? And if you're, if you're in art class, you might sketch out what you want first. You know, on a, you know, do a, a sketch on a piece of paper and figure it out before you go ahead and actually execute it. 
if you're a builder, all right, you're not going out with a bunch of hammer and nails and wood and just pound together a house or a shed or something like that. You're going to think about what you're going to do first. All right? And really that's the process of database design. And that's why we focus on it. We want to get it right. Here is a, there, there's a classic graph that, that people show in IT all the time. And I forget it was attributed to a particular person. Again, I forget the person that um, made this observation. But it's a pretty straightforward observation, and it really applies to, to all aspects of information technology. The graph looks like this. This is the cost to fix something compared to at what stage of the project you discover a problem. All right? And, you know, I have a feeling that this would apply to more things than computer systems, but it definitely applies to computer systems. All right. So, for example, if you find something earlier in the project, it's relatively inexpensive to correct. All right? As you go up, Further on down the line, if you find something near the end of the project, it becomes much more expensive to correct. And really, that graph, if you notice, any, any calculus whizzes in the house, all right? This, uh, this um, graph has a positive first derivative, I think, all right? If anyone out in the audience is watching this. What does that mean? It means it's increasing at an increasing rate, all right? It's not increasing linearly, like a straight line. It's increasing at a faster and faster rate. In fact, in some cases it may be like that, skyrocketing. All right? Through good practices, we can flatten that out a little bit. But it's always going to be increasing at an increasing rate. So, for example, let's think of, go back to the building a house analogy. If I build a house, if I'm planning on building a house, and I decide... Um, that, you know, I want a window there, for example, all right? And then I later on decide, change my mind and say, no, nah, never mind, I don't, I don't want a window there. If it's still in the architect's planning stages and they're still drawing out the plans, how much does it take to correct that? Well, not much. It's trivial, all right? If you're actually living in the house, all right, how much does it take, how much does it cost to make that change? It makes much more, there's a greater cost, a greater inconvenience, greater everything. The, the total overall cost skyrockets. Therefore, we're going to spend a lot of time trying to get our design right. All right, database design really, we can boil it down to three things. Number one, and, and this isn't like a, 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 a one, two, three, four, we do these things in this order. These are the three things that we do, and we kind of like do a little bit of this, do a little bit of that. When we're done, we should have done all these things. All right, so it's not necessarily we do all, all of them in, in exact, like in a linear order. The first thing we want to make sure we do is we want to make sure we identify the entities. All right. Yeah. Identify the entities. The second thing we want to do is we want to make sure the projector's on. All right, but that's just for me. All right, in database design, you usually don't have to worry about that. So the first thing we want to do is identify the entities. You know, we talked a little bit about entities last time, and we talked about um, that entities are, are, are you, you know, sometimes they're called the actors, you know, not like, you know, not like Bruce Willis, that kind of actor, but the thing that plays a part in, in, uh, in that. So, for example, in a, a school database, the actors might be the students and the professors. They're the ones that act within that world of a school database. So we want to identify the entities. Second thing we want to do is we want to identify, and maybe identify isn't the right word. We could maybe also use the word define, the relationships between the entities. 
And the last thing we want to do is identify the attributes and what entity they are associated with. That, in a nutshell, is what we're doing when we're database designing. Every piece of information we're given is going to relate to these things. All right? Is either, you know, if you're talking to someone about a database design project and they say that, you know, my, our, our school has clubs and a student can belong to many clubs and each club has a faculty advisor, for example. All right? That has given us information about the entities, and that has given us information about the relationships. All right? Some of the entities we have, we have clubs, we have students, we have faculty members. We know that there's some sort of relationship between clubs and students. We know there's some sort of relationship between faculty members and clubs. So any information you get about what you're building is giving you probably one of these things. Attributes would be things like, well, for students, we need to know their date of birth, we need to know their email address, and so on and so forth. All right? Okay. The whole process of this, again, it's not like you do the first one and, and are completely done with that and do the second one. You're kind of doing these things all along, all at the same time in a way. All right? Entities we talked about last time. Now I want to focus on relationships. And there really are three different kinds of relationships. And to start out, we're going to focus on two of them. And I'll mention the third, uh, and I'll say a few words about it, but we'll come back to it later on. All right? A relationship is, again, what you would think about just, you know, in, in, you know, in, in, in general conversation where there is some sort of link between two different entities. For example, all right, given, going back to the, the club example where, where a school has some clubs, uh, a student can belong to multiple clubs, and each club has one faculty advisor. All right, we learn something about the relationships. In that case, we actually have, we have three entities, right? The nouns, the actors in this thing, Oh boy, whoops. We have the clubs, we have the faculty advisors, and we have the students. And we can say there's a relationship between faculty and club, right? A club has a faculty advisor. And we can say there's a relationship between club and students. We can draw a line like that. This is the start of an entity relationship diagram. This entity relationship diagram, though, is missing something. And that something is what is called the cardinality of the relationship. Cardinality is a, uh, is a good word. Um, all it really means is, what are the numbers on each end of this relationship? All right. In other words, can a club have more than one faculty advisor? Can a faculty member advise for more than one club? That's what we mean by the cardinality of the relationship. All right. So in addition to the fact that it's not enough to say there is a relationship between faculty and club. You have to say, well, a club has how many faculty advisors? How many clubs can a single faculty advisor um, uh, advise? Now, in databases, it's real simple, all right? Because there's really only two numbers in the database world, all right? One and many. <laughs> if it's more than one, it's many, all right? Sounds silly, but it's true, all right? Either there is a, either for example, a faculty advisor can only advise one club or a faculty advisor can advise many clubs. It's not relevant or important or 
meaningful if, for example, a faculty advisor can, uh, advises three clubs. All right? No, that's many. All right? That's many. All right? It is important whether they can do one or many, but it's not important to say, well, they can advise two or three or four or whatever. If it's more than one, it's many. All right? Now, to identify the cardinality of a relationship, you go both ways. You look in both directions. How many clubs can a faculty member advise? One faculty member can advise how many clubs? Well, I would think, you know, just based, you know, you'd have to ask someone that worked at the school for sure, all right? But I would think that one faculty advisor could probably advise many clubs. Now, in ERD diagrams, oftentimes that's represented like this. That's called a crow's foot ERD, or crow's feet ERD. Kind of looks like a crow's foot, I guess, if you really use your imagination. All right? What this represents in the ERD is that a faculty member can advise many clubs. All right? So you could be the... Um, you know, you could be the advisor for the school paper and the advisor for the creative writing club. All right? And that, that's permissible. All right? But you have to go the other direction as well. Each club has how many faculty advisors? And from the description we gave, we said that each club only has one faculty advisor. All right? So this is how it would represent the relationship on an ERD between club and faculty. A faculty member can advise many clubs. A given club only has one faculty advisor. So that's called a one-to-many relationship. Let's try to identify the relationship between club and students. A club, one club, can have how many students in it? Many. many. A given student can be high in how many clubs? Many. many. That would be called a many-to-many -many relationship. And it would be represented that way with the crow's feet on both ends of the relationship. An alternative way, by the way, to represent uh, a relationship is like this. Rather than making the crow's feet, you can put either a 1 or an M on the other end. I tend to do things very simply. There's other things that can be done on ERDs. Like, for example, if it's an optional relationship or required relationship, like, is it possible to have a club without any faculty advisors? If that's not true, you show it one way. I tend to just keep it simple and, and stress the cardinality of the relationships because that's really what's, what's probably the most critical thing to identify, at least at first. All right. There's three kinds of relationships. And as I mentioned before, we're going to start out looking at two closely, and the third one we're going to identify and, and put it on the back burner for now. We've seen two of the three relationships, two of the three of the kinds of relationships, and then there's one more. One kind of relationship is a one-to-many relationship. In our example, between faculty and club. All right? Keep in mind, and, and sort of a mistake that some students make is they only look at it going in one direction and they miss sort of the, the, the whole thing. To really identify a one-to-many relationship, you have to identify that one faculty person has many clubs, but then you have to go the other direction and say, a club can have how many faculty people? And that will help you determine that it indeed is a one-to-many relationship. If you forget to go both ways, you may misidentify a relationship a many-to-many -many relationship as a one-to-many or whatever. So you have to go in both directions. All right? So a one-to-many relationship um, is one of the very common kinds of relationships that you have in relational databases. If you think about it in a school environment, um, you'd see this a lot. The relationship between 
an instructor in a class. It's a one-to-many relationship. I teach many classes, all right? Each class is taught by one instructor, all right? Relationship between department and faculty person is a one-to-many. The department, or the division, the business division, has many faculty members. Each faculty member belongs to one division. So, there's so a lot of one-to-many relationships out there. The second kind of relationship you have is a many-to-many -many relationship. And in our case, it is between club and student. And again, you've got to go looking in both directions. One club has how many students? Multiple students, right? A given student can be in how many clubs? Well, they can be in multiple clubs according to the description I gave. So really there's a many on both ends. Again, if you forget to go both directions, you're liable to identify this as a one-to-many when really it's a many-to-many because -many, you have to look at it going both directions. Notice when I, when I reviewed this, um, I said that a student can be in multiple clubs. I never said that a club can have multiple students. You kind of had to read between the lines. You know, a club with only one student really isn't a lot of fun, right? So it's sort of implied just by the word club that there's more than one student in it, all right? And I say that, it, it, you know, I say that, you know, it sounds funny, but, but I'm sort of being serious here, too. Um, sometimes you have to use uh, uh, just your, your experience with the world and, and your understanding of what certain terms mean and that sort of things. Now, that being said, if there's any doubt in your mind, you should ask. For example, the assumption that each class has one instructor. Is that a good assumption? I don't know. All right? Every class I've ever taught has only had in one instructor, but is it possible for there to be a class somewhere that has multiple instructors? Maybe one instructor for the lecture, one instructor for the lab, for example. All right? So you've got to be real careful when you start making these assumptions. All right? um, but again, the, the whole art of talking to an, an end user about their uh, about their organization and understanding the entity and the relationships is an art and that, that just takes a lot of practice and comes with time and um, for those people that think for example that uh, you know gee I'm a technical person you know therefore writing skills or, 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 or oral spoken skills aren't important all right, they're flat out wrong. You may understand the way databases are designed, but if you can't communicate with users to figure out what, they're, what they need to do, then you're going to de develop something that may be technically sound, but doesn't serve the needs of the organization, and therefore it won't be particularly effective. So, one to many, sometimes represented as one to M. Many to many, M to M. What do you suppose the third one is? One to one. Now, one to one relationships are kind of hard to think of. All right? They're not all that common. All right? But there's a handful of cases where they really, they, they do exist. And um, we'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll look at them more closely later on, but I do want to introduce them to you now, but this, we're not, this one we're not going to dwell on right now. An example on the college might be the relationship between the dean and a division. All right? One dean is the dean of just one division. Our dean is Dr. Robert Young. All right? He is only the division uh, the dean of the business division. He's not also, and he could, and not only is he not, he could not be also the dean of engineering, right? He could not also be the dean of, uh, you know, health services or whatever. He's only allowed to be the dean of one division. And each division only has one dean. Near as I know, there's never co-deans or co-chairs of a division. 
Therefore, it truly is a one-to-one -one relationship. Other example might be between, let's say, the head coach and a football team, right? There, you know, there's not a coach that's the coach of both the Browns and the Steelers, right? That really, you know, is kind of absurd to even think of. In addition, there's always a head coach. There's not a tag team head coach where, you know, the first and third quarter they switch off or something goofy like that. All right, so that's an example of a one-to-one -one relationship. But really, one-to-one -one relationships, uh, with a couple of exceptions, are sort of rare. So we're going to put those on the back burner now, and we're going to keep our focus on the one-to-many and the many-to-many. -many. All right? Let's look at the one-to-many relationship. And we'll spend a few minutes looking at it, and then we'll create one in access. The example we, gave, we did last week, by the way, or not last week, but last class, was an example of a, of a one to many relationship. So, before we do that, I want to say one last word about this diagram. Is there a relationship between and again, for this, for this example, let's just focus on the clubs of the school, not the classroom activities of the school, or the advisor activities, or anything like that. Is there a relationship between faculty and students? There sort of is, right? If, for example, let's say this was the ski club, all right, you, you half dozen or so students were, were, or ten students, however many there are in here, were the ski club. And let's say I was the advisor of the ski club. You could say, well, there's sort of a relationship. I'm the advisor of the club. You folks are students of the club. So yeah, there kind of is. But in database terms, that's what's called a derived relationship. Because there's not really a direct relationship between me and you. The relationship is through the fact that I'm the advisor of the ski club. You're a member of the ski club. All right? In other words, if I were to resign as being advisor of the ski club and Mr. Norad took over, all right, then you folks would no longer have a relationship with me. You'd have it with Mr. Norad. Or if one of you were to drop out of the ski club, all right, then we would still no longer have a relationship. That's what's known as a derived relationship, all right? In other words, yeah, there's kind of relationship between faculty and student, but it's through the fact that they're associated with the same club. So it's kind of like, yeah, there is, but we don't show that as a relationship on our ERD. That relationship is defined by the fact that we're both associated with the same club. We both have a relationship with uh, a particular club. So. One thing that students sometimes do is try to create all the relationships that they can conceive in their head. Keep in mind that some of the relationships are actually derived relationships, and you don't really need to show those. You just really describe the relationships that are really there and really solid. All right, on to looking at the one-to-many -to -one -to relationship in more detail. We have our faculty person, and we have our clubs. Let's say in this example, we're going to use surrogate keys. So we're going to use auto number keys. And when we get into access, we'll see what I mean in more detail. So the, uh, the, the faculty person will have an ID, will have a faculty ID that will be the primary key. And maybe we'll store their first name, their last name, their email, and their office. In the club table, there's going to be a club ID. There'll be a club name, and maybe a description of what the club does. And then maybe some other details as well. Our focus when we first start looking at database design 
is going to be on these two aspects of it. We'll identify a few attributes, but we'll leave, our, we'll leave the focus on attributes to a little later on in the process. So really, our focus for the first couple of examples is going to be on identifying the entities and identifying the relationships. Now, we already said that there's a one-to-many relationship between faculty and clubs. One faculty person can advise many clubs. Each club is advised by one faculty person. Now, we know from what we talked about in previous classes that the way that you implement a relationship is through what's called a foreign key. All right? We'll put a foreign key in one of these tables to point to the primary key of the other table. All right? What would we add to which table to create this relationship? Where would we put the foreign key? What would it be? And so on. Any ideas? Pardon me? Yeah. We would put a faculty ID as a foreign key in the club table. So, with each club, in addition to the information about the club, we're going to store the information about who the faculty person is. Now, notice we're not storing everything about the faculty person. We're not storing their first name, their last name, their email address, their office. We're just storing, essentially, a pointer to that faculty person. We're saying, who's the advisor of this club? We're pointing and saying, faculty number 197 is. All right, who's the advisor of this club? Well, faculty member 197 also is the advisor of this club, and so on down the line. Now, this is how you're going to do every single one-to-many relationship. All right, the many points to the one. So whatever relationships on the many end of the one-to-many relationship, will point to the relationship on the one end. Which if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Let's imagine that each one of you was a club, all right? And I was a faculty advisor for all the clubs. Can I point to all of you and say, I'm the advisor of this club? Oh yeah, and this club, and oh yeah. I can't point to all the different clubs. You all could point to me though and say, there's my advisor. And that's effectively what having this faculty ID in here does. It says this club is advised by the faculty member that has this ID. And then we can establish a foreign key and, and be in business. The, when we establish the foreign key, then we have referential integrity, which means we cannot put in a club that has a bogus faculty ID, that has a faculty ID of some non-existent faculty member. All right? And we can't associate more than one faculty person with this club, right? Because there's only one slot for the faculty ID. We can, however, have a faculty person advise more than one club, right? Because if I was faculty member 197 again, I could be in there for the chess club and the computer club and the art club or whatever. I could be in this one several times. So let's go and let's create these tables in Access to, to show you what I mean for this one. All right. All right, I'm going to go and on the des desktop, I'm going to create a database called clubs. Oh, 
Oops. Dot ACC DB. All right. So I'll create on the desktop a database called clubs. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to create those two tables. All right. So as usual, because I've created an empty um, database, it gives me a table for free. However, I'm going to right mouse on that table and say I want to go to design view. All right. And I'm going to put this in as faculty and create the faculty table. And I'm going to make the faculty primary key, the faculty ID, an auto number. And by auto number, what that means is that the first row that I insert in this table is going to get a 1 for their faculty ID. The second row is going to get a 2. The third row is going to get a 3 and so on. It's pretty common to do that, right? Um, you can probably tell, uh, we could probably sort the order in which people uh, uh, enrolled here at LC based on their, their student numbers, right? The lower the student number they had, the longer ago you enrolled. All right, the higher the student number, the more recently. So essentially, they use an auto number for that student number. In other words, the student after you probably has a, a, a student number one higher than yours. So it just automatically increments. I'll put in the first name, last name, email, and office. I'm not, in the interest of time, I'm not paying too close attention to this metadata here, but if you're creating one for real, you know, you, you should go in and, and fill that in. For example, you'd want to make uh, first name required, make last name required, and so on down the line. All right, so now I can save that. I'm going to go in and create now the table for the clubs. Create table. I'll right mouse there, go to design view, put in clubs. And I'm going to make the club ID the primary key to that, which will also be an auto number. Because I don't really care what the numbers are. Um, you know, I don't care if the skiing club is one or the volleyball club is one or whatever. It doesn't really matter. It's just going to be used internally to link stuff together. When we start linking the club table to, to others, we're going to need that value. Um, now, you might, be, you might think, well, why don't I just use the club name as the primary key, right? That's going to be unique. There's not going to be two skiing clubs on campus, or, you know, really wouldn't make sense if there were. They probably would pre pre prevent that from happening. In addition, every club's going to have a name, you know. It's not going to be like some sort of secret organization club that doesn't have a name. You know, what club do you want to join? Sorry, can't say the name of it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, therefore, could you use the name as a primary key? You could. All right. Why am I not doing that? Well, there's a couple reasons, uh, and we'll spend more time on this later, but one thing about primary keys is, generally speaking, the shorter the key, the better, all right? Because remember, that key is going to get stored in several places, and therefore, the smaller it is, the better it's going to be, all right? So we're not going to make the club name the primary key. We're going to make the club ID, and then I'll put in a description of it. And, based on what we said here, the faculty ID is going to be stored in a club table so that the faculty ID in here can point to the faculty ID that is their advisor. So I'm going to go in here and put faculty ID. Now, it's not text, right? It's an auto number. Well. You don't make it an auto number here because I don't want it to automatically generate. In other words, the first club isn't advised by advisor one. There's no tie that way. 
So instead of making it an auto number field, I just make it a regular number field. So I can match a number to a, to a number, and that's fine. All right, I can close this. And I can then go in and create the relationship. And I can add. And then I can drag, and it doesn't matter the, the order that you do it, it but I'm going to drag that faculty ID to faculty ID. All right. Enforce referential integrity. Yes. Create. And if you notice, this sort of looks like my ERD. That's a good thing. All right. Here we have a one to many. If we view it this way, a one to the little in infinite infinity sign, you know, means many. All right. Now, we're not connecting the club ID with the faculty ID. That's a mistake people do. You rarely connect, I won't say never, but you rarely connect primary key to primary key. You uh, connect an attribute in one table with a primary key of another table. There does need to be a primary key involved, however. All right? In whatever table is the one end of it, so the parent table, the primary key has to be involved. Now let's go in and let's enter a couple of things just so that we understand how this works. All right? Yes. You said the, uh, the one is always the primary key. Yeah. The the one you're gonna yeah you're gonna link an attribute in the many table to the primary key of the one table. Right. And I won't say never, but rarely are you gonna link primary key to primary key. There's some cases where you do that, but usually it's the attribute in one table. All right, let's go in and enter some data. I'll go enter in a couple faculty advisors. Mike Zellers, Paul Noron, Don Huffman. So one, two, and three. All right. I'll now go and enter the clubs in. So maybe the first club will be the ski club. Description, we ski. All right. Faculty advisor, one. Now, sometimes students at this point in the class get alarmed and say, you mean I have to remember all those faculty IDs? Well, Keep in mind that this is just a quick and dirty way to get data into these tables. We'll learn how you can use forms later on in the class in Access so that we'll have a nice little drop down. So instead of memorizing that we have one, two, and three, and gee, was one, was one Zellers or was one Norad, we'll be able to pick from a list. But for now, just doing it quick and dirty, yeah, you, you remember it and, and you enter it in. Maybe the chess club is... advised by Huffman. Maybe the running club is advised by Norad. And maybe the video game club is advised also by Zellers. Now, again, because we've created a foreign key, I can't go in and say that the um, karate club is advised by faculty member A. Why not? Because there's no such thing as a faculty member aide. If you remember, the three um, faculty IDs that I had in were one, two, and three. All right. Questions about this? Yes. Could you leave the faculty ID blank? Could you leave the faculty ID blank? Like maybe they're founding a club, but they don't know who's going to advise it. You know what? I, I, can, I, can, I can give you the answer to every question that a student's going to ask me this semester. And that answer is, it depends. <laughs> All right? I, I guarantee 95% of the answers I give will be it depends. And in this case, it depends. All right? It depends on what? Well, 
Let's close this and let's go back into the table definition of design view. Faculty ID is defined as a foreign key through the relationships, but down here I put in that it's not required. So in this case, I could put in a club without a faculty ID. But, all right, if I do put in a faculty ID, it has to be a valid one. So the way the database is set up now, I could go and put in the sewing club and not put in a faculty ID because that field was set to be not required. Now if I go and change that and say that that faculty ID is required, now I can't put in that. So, and if you think about it, that makes sense because there could be a case. Um, let's say you hire, um, you know, a, a store hires a bunch of employees. All right, you know, Best Buy hires three people. They might not know what department each one of them is going to go in the day they hire them. Right? They they might hire them. They might put them on the payroll and they might start training them. And they might want to take a little bit of time to get to know them to say, okay, this person work, would work best in customer service, this person would work best in automotive, this person would work best in the computer department. So it might be possible that you wouldn't want to put that in right off the bat. So you might want to be able to leave it blank. However, with a foreign key, if you do put something in, it has to match up. Now on the other hand, uh, a different organization might have a different rule and say, no, we don't hire people, <laughs> you know, until we know where they're going to be. In which case, when we hire them, we need to know what department they're assigned to right off the bat. So, depending on the organization and the rules of that organization would determine how you would set that. All right, but that was a great question. Um, that's where you get into, and I, I believe they show the notation in the book, of whether it's a mandatory relationship or an optional relationship. I think for an optional, they, they put a little O on the end of the ERD, like this. I think. I might be wrong. You can, you can read that on your own. I think that's what they do. Different people have different notations, so it's hard to remember exactly what notation everyone uses. All right. The one thing I did want to talk about this time, but um, we're running out of time, and I'll make a point to talk about it Tuesday, is when would you get an error trying to define a foreign key? All right? There's really three situations where you get an error. And I think I briefly mentioned those last time, but I want to show some concrete examples. So. Um, I wish I could get that in today, but uh, I'm not able to, so we'll make a point to do that Tuesday. If I do not cover it Tuesday, please someone remind me. And in fact, if you're trying to do an assignment and cannot create a foreign key, please email me and I'll, I'll be able to, to go over that with you uh, via email prior to that. All right, questions? All right, I will upload this example and Next time we'll talk about when you can't define a foreign key and we'll start getting into the many-to-many -many relationships. We will probably have some practice exercises next week too. By practice exercises, I mean um, I'll present a problem to you, you'll talk about it between, uh, you know, maybe in small groups, and then we'll discuss the solution for it. All right, have a great weekend. Uh, we'll see those of you going to lab. We'll see you over in lab.